He finally came in. Rome has pretty much defeat, defeated its Grecian and other enemy powers. And Rome completely took everything over. And then Caesar expanded the empire even further. Let's start off in this passage. But before we read this one, there is a passage in the Word of God that says that Luke chapter 2 verse 1, came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So the word Caesar, where did that word come from? It came from this man, Caius Julius Caesar. So this man will be important to pave the way for other Caesars in the future. Page 118 of Widowson's book, Caius Julius Caesar, according to Durant, in his third book in the series, The Story of Civilization, called Caesar and Christ, traced his pedigree to Julius Ascanius, son of Anus, who had escaped from Troy, son of Venus or Ishtar, who may be the feminine counterpart to Satan, as we have previously discussed. If you remember, some early gods were possessed of feminine and masculine identities. In any event, Caesar, a person's name, is the name from which words for leaders like the Caesar of Russia was derived. He personally believed that his ancestry began with Jupiter, Venus's father, the Roman derivation of the name Zeus, whom I have stated is the same god as Odin in Norse mythology, Viracocha in Peru, etc., etc., of course, we don't know if he truly believed this claim or if it was, as Plato had said of his own leaders, a political ploy to claim legitimacy by descent from the gods themselves. So this was common knowledge, as we have learned in previous discipleship classes, that people like Julius Caesar and other emperors of other pagan nations round about them, they would take or they would take the claim that they descended from the gods that the gods pass them this knowledge. And then some mythologies claim that the emperors, they were able to live about a millennia of length, a millennia spanned. So that could be the case with Julius Caesar, that his ancestry goes all the way back to divine emperors who received it from divine gods themselves. Or it could be just out of his own pride to give him more credibility and more popularity among the common people, either or. Theodore Dodge, in his book Caesar, states that Caesar came from an old pat patrician family that had moved to Rome from Alba under the reign of Tullus Hostilius and had held many public positions through the years. His father, a public official, had died when he was about 16. His mother, Aurelia, was of plebeian, plebeian origin but was a woman of fine character. Caesar was very, very proud of his ancestry and brought it up quite frequently, particularly at a famous funeral oration for his aunt. Aurelia devoted her life to her son's education, which Dodge claims was the foundation of his success. Michael Grant, in his work entitled The Twelve Caesars, quotes a more ancient work by Roman biographer Suetonius, who wrote Lives of the Caesars. When he tells us how Caesar's aunt was the wife of the great general Marius, and that Caesar himself married the daughter of Marius' successor, Cena. We are told that his first great success was his appointment as chief priest or Pontifex Maximus. For some of you who don't know, when he took that title upon himself, that was a title that was in reference to popes later on from the Catholic Church. A title the Pope, head of the Vatican, and the Roman Catholic Church is known by today. This was in 63 BC. Three years later, he was snubbed for his bid to be governor of Spain, and he formed an alliance with the Roman general and political leader Pompey and the wealthy Crassus. In 59, he became consul in a ruthless power drive. Then, between 58 and 51, he conquered the whole of central and northern Gaul, as far as the Rhine River, which he briefly crossed. In 55 and 54, he entered Britain unsuccessfully, and left us a vivid description of the Celtic warriors he found there. The union between the three powerful men broke down, and as Rome's democracy was a hotbed of corruption and chaos, it was inevitable that a civil war could ensue. 
Caesar came out on top in that conflict and became absolute dictator of Rome. So now we see how Caesar was able to become absolute dictator of Rome. Remember beforehand, Rome was consisting of different aris aristocratic powers, so to speak, or the elites, kind of like our modern society today in the conspiratorial world realm of thinking, so to speak. But aside from that fact, we see that that's how the Roman Empire now consolidated everything of nations uh, in like a third of the world, the Roman Empire. Now the world is bound by one ruler. And that's what Jesus was waiting for. Jesus was waiting for a timeline where it wouldn't be separate powers, but all under one power so that his ministry can spread more effectively. Usually what you're going to notice that throughout later history stories, history accounts of absolute dictators, that's how the gospel can spread more easily, is through absolute dictators. Because, it get, because an absolute dictator has full free reign and control to access to the furthest part of the country. He's not hindered and blocked, you see, by politics or different aristocratic powers. One side issue of note is that the decaying Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt was ruled by a queen named Cleopatra. Remember, that was found at Daniel chapter 11. The Seleucids versus the, Ptol uh, the Ptolemies. We've seen that with uh, Syria versus Egypt throughout Daniel 11. And Cleopatra, because she was originally of Syrian descent, but then she was given away to Egypt, uh, the Syrian king and ruler, his plans failed in conquering Egypt as effectively as he wanted to because Cleopatra did not listen to her father that gave her away to the Egyptian ruler. So now she's rulership in Egypt. But Caesar, it is said over here, who Durant tells us was by origin a Macedonian Greek. So this is interesting, that means. This means, therefore, probably a blonde and not the raven-haired brunette of movie fame. That's her appearance. Caesar's relationship with her was disastrous and has been the subject of many soap opera style movies. But in the grand scheme of human history, it's practically irrelevant, so we move on. <laughs> Usually the world likes to glamorize romantic stories, right? Soap operas. So let's just pass on. <clears throat> Doesn't bear much fruit to history. Grant calls Caesar's conquest of Gaul a decisive act in world history by which Central Europe was opened up to Mediterranean civilization. He also goes on to quote the Roman Cicero that Caesar's conquests were a disaster for Rome. Grant tells us that his army was the most potent, effective, responsive martial instrument the world has ever seen. Dodge has written a nearly 800 page book on Caesar's military successes and Caesar himself authored books relating his successes. In fact, there are countless books on the subject of his military victories and how they affected world history. Eventually, so we notice so far from this reading that Caesar, that his battles and war tactics were also studied. So he became one of the famous generals where people who studied war tactics were able to derive their knowledge from. So... You might recall Hannibal was also another general that a lot of people and military officials were interested in studying his war tactics. Another person you want to study is Julius Caesar if you want to learn more about military conquest and power, his tactics and plans. He was assassinated by his political rivals, even some he thought to be friends. For his, arrogant and his, for his arrogance and his assumption of all power in Rome. You might recall the famous Shakespearean play, Julius Caesar, and one of his close friends was a man named Brutus. And Brutus's speech became a very famous quotation that a lot of students at schools began to memorize even till today. I was one of them. I had to memorize all of Brutus' speech. But remember that name Brutus derived from a name from long, long time ago in ancient Latin and Roman and perhaps Etruscan history, that name if you might recall. Let's return to our 
main text over here now who took over Gaius Octavius who is that guy look at Luke chapter 2 verse 1 turn to Luke chapter 2 verse 1 your hand is already at Matthew 15 and 23 keep it there but now turn to Luke chapter 2 the Bible mentions the first Caesar and he you notice Julius Caesar is very very famous but the person who took that title Caesar was not Julius Caesar himself the Lord did not see that the Lord saw Octavius as the man to take that title to mention as noteworthy in the scripture why because remember history is centered around Israel his people around Jesus Christ so I don't care how famous Julius Caesar is God says his name is not going to be mentioned the first mention of Caesar would not be Julius Caesar God says it'll be Octavius and it came verse 1 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed that was what God was waiting for he was waiting where Julius Caesar would be able to have world domination and full control and Gaius Octavius was able to take it over so why is that that way his scriptures can be fulfilled that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem why because Joseph had to move from his homeland from his hometown and travel all the way miles and miles away to Bethlehem under the decree of taxation from Gaius Octavius the Lord's plan was a million miles ahead as you might notice the Lord is a genius Julius Caesar responded his career and adopted him so this is Gaius Octavius' story Caesar adopted Octavius Octavian pursued a 14-year struggle after the dictator's death for power and eventually became Emperor of Rome finally defeating Caesar's friend Mark Antony through Octavian's own ally the name which is going to be famous throughout the Bible is Agrippa as you might recall in the book of Acts one of the rulers named Agrippa was being ministered to by Paul but he didn't receive the gospel but another name which you're gonna find out is Herod usually Agrippas and Herods they some of some of the people would like to adapt and take the names from these rulers so there were several Herods, just like several Caesars. So remember that Octavius' name in the Bible is known as Augustus. Now let's keep reading. The struggle which had lasted since Julius Caesar's murder in 44 BC was destined to come to an end with Antony's defeat. The next year what happened Widowson keeps pointing out that Mark Antony who had romantic relationship with Cleopatra they both were defeated by Octavius's power these were the two powers that went after Julius Caesar Octavius was the one that won so then the Lord you'll notice over here he didn't care too much about Cleopatra or Antony all he thought about was who's gonna be the one who will pave the way for my son who will be born in the city of Bethlehem people make a big deal out of names that the Lord doesn't actually really care about and the Lord's name which everyone should care about practically everyone don't care about the name of Jesus they get more into these guys than the Lord Jesus Christ the next year Antony and Cleopatra who had become his lover also committed suicide Augustus received the title of chief priest in 12 BC and father of the country in 2 BC he continued to rule until his death in 14 AD with his hand-picked successor Tiberius exercising most of the real power or so grant tells us so 
After that, a man came in power named Tiberius. But let's not talk about Tiberius for now. We shall return to him because the Bible mentions something important about this person. Let's go back to Daniel 11. Daniel 11. Remember, the prophet Daniel was prophesying in the future about the conquest or the division before Julius Caesar's timeline. It prophesied about Cleopatra. It also taught, prophesied about the Seleucids versus the Ptolemies, Egypt and Syria. But then the prophet Daniel mentions this, which I told you at our last discipleship, Ruckman gives a different perspective and outlook than Larkin and Henry Morse and other classical dispensationalists. So if Dr. Ruckman's perspective is true, this will be intensely interesting. If you look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 18 through 19, I mentioned to you before, this is where it goes between the Ptolemies versus the Seleucids. And then 20, 21, and all the way onward, I mentioned to you about Antiochus Epiphanes versus the Maccabees. But then the Lord, he <coughs> takes a different perspective if Dr. Upman's outlook is true. So this is what he teaches accordingly, I'm going to say now. He jumps ahead in verse 20 where the prophecy is about Caesar Augustus, Octavius. This is not referring to the ruler that was slightly before the Antiochuses that time. Verse 20, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now if you go back to Luke chapter 2 verse 1, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So notice that this can match up at Daniel 11 where Rome is involved with this conflict of Syria and Egypt. Remember, Syria is prophesied, if my memory serves me right, in Daniel 11.20. That's what classical dispensationalists will agree with. But the thing that they could be wrong about is that it's not referring to perhaps a Syrian ruler that time, but jumps much more ahead of time. It would refer to Caesar Augustus, where the Syrian region would be mentioned. Verse 3 of Luke chapter 2 says, And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. If this is the case, then what is interesting is that if the latter part, uh, verse 20, or the middle part of verse 20, a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. That's key. So this might support Ruckman's point more than Larkin's point. Because the raising of taxes was for the glory of the kingdom. History records, so a lot of the other historical perspectives I won't be reading quotes from, what I would recommend onliners is to research it themselves. But Octavius, he was the one primarily responsible for the glory of his kingdom. And taxation was necessary for that. So this can support this person more than the other ruler that Larkin and other people mistakenly might think. Might mistakenly think. It would support that context. But not only that, this is very interesting. The latter part of verse 20. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now to be fair to Larkin's point of view, this might support Larkin's side. Because the ruler that they mention was not a very long length of time. Augustus seems to be much longer. However, what does few days mean? If you compare with few days with what Larkin says about many days, when you go to the latter part of the verses of Daniel chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 33. They believe this part is referring, as I read this passage before in our last discipleship, of the nation of Israel wandering without a nation ever since uh, after Jesus Christ died on the cross, the fall of Jerusalem at the first century, all the way to today, to the timeline of the tribulation. 
Because of verse 33, it says many days. See that? Many days. So that's practically almost 2,000 years then. 2,000 years. That's what many days would refer to according to Larkin. Then, if that's the case, if we compare that as long length of time of many years, if that's what many days refers to, then to be quite honest, if we go back to Daniel 11.20, few days would be an accurate comparison of Augustus's years. Because that length of time of his years of rulership is very few in comparison compared to almost 2,000 years of many days of Israel losing their nation. Does everybody understand what I mean? So this does not necessarily have to debunk Rutman's point. Few days could probably work for both sides, if we're going to be fair. Totally fair and unbiased, it would work for both sides. It would work for Larkin or Ruckman. But what would build up Ruckman's position even more is not just the first part in the glory of the kingdom, but the last part of verse 20. It says, few days he shall be destroyed. Destroyed. But he's destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. That's the big key over here. Larkin's ruler in this passage, he actually died through anger, so to speak, even though it was not in battle. But Augustus, people naturally recorded as a normal passing away he died, just like this one. Verse 20, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. So he just, it's like a natural death here, but it said destroyed here. That means it was a hidden conspiracy he died. The Larkin's ruler, it's not a hidden conspiracy, but Augustus is. Augustus, they would publicly record him as natural death, but historian says, however, there is conspiracies that uh, he may have been assassinated. It was an assassination attempt. So historians are not sure, but they just recorded naturally because that's what the public naturally knows about. But the secret is that it was an assassination. So this would fulfill scripture even better with Octavius, Caesar Augustus, as a fulfillment of Daniel 11.20. But not only that, if we take it that way, the chronology would definitely match Ruckman's at verse 21, 22, 23. That one is very, very anti-Christ here. Not Antiochus Epiphanes, the language here. He makes the league works deceitfully. It says, the prince of the covenant, arms of a flood. That totally matches up with Revelation 12 and Daniel 9. All the wording about the Antichrist in the tribulation. So, verse 20 would be natural then that this would be referring to a Roman ruler then. And then 21, the Antichrist, who is a Roman ruler, follows along that. In verse 21, the Antichrist, who is of Roman descent, as you might have already learned from your Revelation studies, right? That he is of Roman rulership. So then see that chronology, that setting up the context of verse 20 would be more natural and perfect if we take Ruckman's perspective. But if we don't take Ruckman's perspective at verse 20, then it'll just ruin the setup and context of verse 21 through 23, which really looks more like the Antichrist in Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so now that we've uh, learned some interesting parts of Scripture, let's go back to the nation of Israel. Now, the nation of Israel, that is God's kingdom, but he doesn't pay much attention to the Maccabees in your Scripture. That shows that how God is very disinterested in Maccabees. Israel, God pays attention to, but he doesn't pay attention to Maccabees. That should speak volumes. He doesn't pay attention to the people responsible for creating supposedly your LXX or the Dead Sea Scrolls too. How about that? Isn't that something enlightening for you? That shows that God don't consider that as important or relevant either as his people's history or God thinks it's heresy. And I believe it's the latter. But let's talk about a little bit about these people. So let's set up Maccabees. As we have previously stated, in 143 BC, Simon Maccabee secured the independence of Judea, the area that was formerly part of the ancient state of Israel, from the Seleucid king. He was named general and high priest of the Second Jewish Commonwealth by a popular assembly which also made his office hereditary in his Hasmonean family. 
Judea became a theocracy or a union of state and religion under this dynasty of priest kings. Ah, look at this. So now it's like a priest king set up the nation of Israel. That's why you're going to find out these later people that Jesus dealt with. They're actually very powerful people because that's how the Israel's rulership is set up. It's not under a monarchy king. That's gone. It's under a puppet king. His family spent two generations trying to strengthen the borders of this militarily weak kingdom by conquering or absorbing Samaria, Edom, Moab, and Galilee, among other areas. This dynasty, whose forebears had fought so hard to have religious freedom under the tyranny of the pagan Greek Seleucids, now used the sword to enforce the dictates of Hebrew law on the conquered. So this time of the Maccabees and the Maccabean War, so to speak, they were trying to conquer the Greek pagans, the Greek Seleucids that time. Eventually, they lost their religious zeal as well, though, and reverted more and more back to the Hellenized pagan habits of their former conquerors. Now, that's important to remember. Notice that they took the Hellenized... So this religious system took on a Hellenized... For some of you who don't know, this is referring to the Greek pagan culture that time. That inherited from Alexander the Great. So notice their religious system and their culture. Jews are, missing, are mixing up with Greek paganism. That's important. That is extremely important. Because I'm going to tell you if, real shortly when we look at Matthew 15 and Matthew 23. Go over there now as I keep reading. Finally, when a dispute over rulership occurred, both parties appealed to the superpower Rome under the general Pompey for support. In 63 BC, he made Judea a part of the Roman province of Syria. In 54 BC, Crassus robbed the temple of the treasures that were left. So there you go with the glorious history of Maccabees. Oh, Jews, take pride. We take pride on the Maccabean wars and the revolt. No, you're still in bondage, man. <laughs> Some, some glorious revolt for the glory of God, huh? For the glory of their God. It's, no, it's just nonsense. Didn't really work out. So Matthew chapter 15, this is their culture. Notice that Jesus warned about the Jewish religion. When we look at verse 3, but he answered and said unto them, Why do ye, do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. Amen. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. So Jesus realized that the law of Moses, the Jewish religion, the legitimate Jewish religion, has been corrupted by the tradition and the culture of the Jews. Why? Because they were being influenced by the pagans and their own ideologies. This is a perfect description of America. America loses its purity, its godly principles. And they get influenced by the pagan cultures of our time and they try to mingle up God with that in Christian churches but then there's a pure breed the Republicans the conservatives let's all vote for pro-Trump who tried to be purity from this pagan liberalism but that represents what we're going to find out the Pharisees and guess what? It doesn't matter if you're a right-wing Republican or Tea Party. They're as far away as the Bible as you can see. And the Republican Party is rich, and Fox News is rich with Catholicism. See? It doesn't change that fact. So when you want to study uh, the history of America or the future of America, just look at the history of Israel. And you'll predict where America's going to go when you look at Israel. History and prophecy, I strongly believe, go hand in hand. The beginning goes with the end. The past goes with the future. That's how I see it as. But we're going to see more interesting things later. Let me just cover a bit about these ridiculous, nonsensical peoples. The Apocrypha, right? 
All right. Where it records the glorious conquest of the Maccabees. So why is the Apocrypha wrong, Pastor? The Apocrypha is wrong because Tobit chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. I'm going to give you a few passages that you can write down to debunk some of the people who believe the Apocrypha should be a part of your biblical history, when actually not. Now, if you want to put as part of history, that's okay. The KJV translators, they put that in between the Testaments as a history record, but they don't put that as biblical history because they deliberately labeled Apocrypha on every page of the Apocryphal books they put in the King James Bible. But the Old Testament, New Testament, they left it blank. They didn't label Apocrypha on top of the page or anything like that because they consider that as part of the Bible. Tobit 6, 5 through 7. Now, does this sound like scripture to you or witchcraft? Then the angel said to him, Take out the entrails of this fish and lay up his heart and his gall and his liver for thee, for these are necessary for useful medicines. And when he had done so, he roasted the flesh thereof and... The, they took it with them in the way. The rest they salted as much as might serve them till they came to Rages, the city of the Medes. Then Tobias asked the angel and said to him, I beseech thee, brother Azarias, tell me what remedies are these things good for, which thou hast bid me keep of the fish. And the angel answering said to him, If thou put a little piece of its heart upon coals, the smoke thereof driveth away all kind of devils either from man or from woman, so that they come no more to them. The entrails and heart and liver of a fish to drive away spirits, that's shamanism. That's shamanism all the way from ancient history that I talked to you about. And where did they get that idea? The religion all the way back to Satan's religion. Semiram Semiramis and Nimrod. The Greek pagan culture, Semiramis and Nimrod, and God's people, the Jews, is getting mingled with that. And thinking that's part of the Apocrypha is a necessary book. When you mingle that with Judaism, that's evidence right here that Satan's Babylonian religion was infesting. But let's keep reading here. This is evidence. Tobit chapter 12, verse 9. Alms cleanses all your sins. Wait, that's Babylonian Catholicism, is it not? Look at that. This is infesting Jewish sex this time. For alms delivereth from death, and the same is that which purgeth away sins and maketh to find mercy and life everlasting. No, the Bible says that the blood purgeth away our sins. Now, this is, here are some hilarious, hilarious passages. Now, remember the Jews, they had this conflict with the Antiochuses. Remember that? The Antiochuses were despised by the Jews. That's why they did their Maccabean revolts. Now look what they record of Antiochus's death. This is hilarious. It's like you're reading, uh, you're going to picture, just picture Jabba the Hutt in Star Wars, what I'm about to read to you, okay? Second Maccabees, chapter 9, verse 5 through 6 and verse 18. But the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, smote him with an incurable and invisible plague, or as soon as he had spoken these words, the pain of the bowels that was remedilious came upon him and sore torments of the inner parts. And that most justly, for he had tormented other men's bowels with many and strange torments, so that the worms rose up out of the body of this wicked man. And whilst he lived in sorrow and pain, his flesh fell away, and the filthiness of his smell was noisome to all his army, but for all this his pains would not cease. For the just judgment of God was come upon him, therefore despairing of his health. Now, did you read so far? It says that God's judgment was worms were rising out of his body and his flesh was like, I'm melting, you know. And it was rotting away. His flesh was falling apart. And the no every movement he made with his flesh, it was like a noise like Java the Hutt. <laughs> Now, you see this? This is, this is part of your scriptures. This is part of your scriptures. It's a, fairy it's a fairy tale story like the guy who created Star Wars. It's a figment of their imaginations. But let's keep reading here. You got to picture this. While he's rotting away, he's writing a letter in sound body and mind. Therefore, despairing of his health, he wrote unto the Jews the letter underwritten, containing the form of a supplication after this manner. 
Why in the world, man? Now, this is, uh, if you want to know about the Maccabean wars, like, oh, this is for the glory of God. Well, look how glorious this war was for the glory of God. This is during the, their battles against the pagans, the Jews against the pagans at that time. This is found at 2 Maccabees. In 2 Maccabees, it reads the following passages. The soldiers were about to capture the tower where Rhazes had gone. They were forcing open the gates to the courtyard, and the order had been given to set the door on fire. Rhazes realized there was no escape, so he tried to commit suicide with his sore, sword, preferring to die with honor rather than suffer humiliation at the hands of evil men. Under the pressure of the moment, Rhesus misjudged the thrust of the sword, and it did not kill him. So while the soldiers were swarming into the room, he, <coughs> he rushed to the wall. And what did he do once he rushed to the wall? Da, 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 da. He jumped off like a brave hero into the crowd below. Ah. <laughs> the crowd quickly, now this is a comedy show. The crowd quickly moved back. Splat, and he fell into the space they left. What? what? <laughs> this is your Bible. This is, should be a part of your Bible, really? Maccabees, Maccabees, yes! No, this is not. God sees this as, this is stupid. I don't record my saints dying that way. Still alive, he's still alive. And burning with courage, burning with courage, he got up. And with blood gushing from his wounds, he ran through the crowd and finally climbed up a steep rock. Now completely drained of blood, he tore out his intestines with both hands and threw them at the crowd as he did so. He prayed for the Lord of life and breath to give them back to him. <laughs> Second Maccabees, in your holy scriptures, holy Bible. What in the world? So you think that God approves of this? You got to be kidding me, man. You gotta be kidding me, of course not. Now let's talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls here. Now, uh, I don't really say this online, but this is a book that I wrote. I guess I have to document it. So it's called Ruckmanism Ruckus. So that's a book that I wrote. I don't really pop, uh, I don't really advertise it, but I have to read a portion here. That way I can give legitimacy in my quotes, okay? So I wrote this in my work, and then you can compare uh, and research online to see the validity of the history with the Essenes. Now the Essenes, they were the ones responsible for the Dead Sea Scroll. They were another Jewish sect, but they were rejected by mainstream traditional Jewish leaders at time. So these guys are basically a strange cult. They're a strange, weird little cult. Here's the following thing about the Essenes that you want to know about at Qumran. So, I forgot to write that down. Essenes. Here we go with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They believed with, uh, this is found at page 218 of my work. They believed without scriptural reasons that they should repudiate marriage because they look on a woman as a selfish creature and specially addicted to jealousy and hypocrisy thus likely to dissolve their brotherhood. A man bound to a woman is hampered by his affection, is no longer a free man but a slave. They were considered as outcasts from the Jewish society. The Essenes rejected the blood sacrifice of animals, which was commanded by the Jewish Mosaic law. They believed in three messiahs rather than in one messiah. Not only were they heretical, but they also changed the words of God in the Old Testament scriptures. Dr. Lee Martin McDonald, professor of New Testament studies and president of Acadia Divinity College, agrees with other authorities and scholars, quote, a command in Deuteronomy 4.2 forbids adding to or taking from the text. And this became a standard for how Jews dealt with their sacred literature to maintain its inviability. The Essene community, however, frequently changed or altered sacred texts. So this is why the Dead Sea Scroll should not be used as the final authority to correct your King James Bible, as some scholars might want to do. 
The Essenes at Qumran uh, deleted or added sentences and words within the text and made other changes as well. Matters such as word division, syntax, and spelling appear to have been of little concern to the scribes at Qumran. Wow, how about that? That's what Dr. McDonald said. All right, I continue reading from my text over here. Moreover, there are arguments from scholars that the Dead Sea Scrolls were not written in the centuries before Christ, but rather in the first and early cent second centuries A.D. So that's something to consider. All right, now that you know about the heresies that was spreading during the Hellenized Greek pagan culture and the Maccabees, Let's see how Jewish worship was set up. Herod was installed by Rome, according to Durant, in 37 BC. He was by all accounts an evil man, a despotic ruler. He killed entire families if one was accused of conspiring against him and even imprisoned and killed members of his own immediate family. He tore down the temple of Zerubbabel and built the one that would later be destroyed by Rome. When Herod died, his will divided his kingdom between his three remaining sons. There was a tremendous tension between the pagan Greek inhabitants of this small country and the devout Jewish population. Most people were peasant farmers, so successful then the time of Christ, they raised enough wheat to export a surplus. The temple itself was the national bank, where the Sanhedrin or the great council of the elders of Israel met. This institution might have arose under the Seleucids, to replace the biblical advisors to Moses in number 16, but we aren't sure. Now that's interesting. So then there is supposed, there is supposed guesswork that if the Seleucids, which God warned at Daniel 11, the Seleucids may have been the ones responsible, which where the Antichrist will eventually come out, remember, that they infected the Jewish religious system and set up the Jewish religious system. Semiramis and Nim Nimrod's Babylonia religion was infesting Judaism. But let's keep reading over here. I'm going to give more evidences. A group of Israeli dissidents from, against Prime Minister Sharon's government reinstituted a version of the Sanhedrin in October 2004 and challenged the secular government's authority. The Sanhedrin of the first century BC or AD could command, they could command a punishment of death for a religious offense but could not carry it out without the consent of the civil power. The two main factions were the Pharisees and Sadducees mentioned in the Bible. Look at the book of Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. So here's how the system works. You ready for this? We study now Roman history, right? Egypt has become a small picture. The Jews with their Maccabees. These two pivotal events have set up this tired system that the devil set up. Now that Octavius was gone, Tiberius took it over. Tiberius Caesar. Herod was a despised king among the Jewish people. He was more of a puppet ruler. He could be hardly called Israel's king. But, these, but this Herod was so brutal, he slaughtered babies, as you might recall, at the book of Matthew chapter 2. And then later Herods, they were so despised by the Jews, they hated the Herods, that when one of the Herods died at the book of Acts, the Jewish people, a lot of them rejoiced about that. So this is the second in power, and then right here, it's the religious power. Annas and Caiaphas, they were a high priest that time, during the timeline of Jesus. Underneath them is the part called the Sanhedrin here. The Sanhedrin. The Herodians, they were political powers from Herod. Lawyer scribes were, and rabbis, etc., etc., other religious leaders, they were all religious leaders as part of the Sanhedrin, but the two main factions were Pharisees and Sadducees. Sadducees were the more... Now let's look at American, uh, America's current events today. You ready to see the comparison? Sadducees can be compared to be as very liberal with their pagan world that time, adapting and comprising that with their religious beliefs and system. Then you got the Pharisees at a, as a very strict party 
against the pagan influence of the world. But they put their own meaning into their sacred text. They value the, the word of God, but they put their own meaning into it, their own interpretation into it. And then they force the people to follow a legalistic perspective of what they set up. What does that sound like? Democrats and Republicans. What does that sound like? Today's legal churches, legalism churches. That includes your independent fundamental Baptists. We all talk about I love America, vote Republican. That includes the Mormons who are all about Republicans, but they're very legalistic in their rules. That includes the Catholic Church, purely legalistic with too many rules involved for your salvation. Sadducees are just like today's liberals. We can, and liberal churches, right? Calvary Chapel, Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, and you know, we got to adapt to this modern culture. Ah, what men learn from history is what class? Men never learn from history. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Man, I'm speaking very excitedly here because I'm trying to pinpoint something right here. I'm hitting the nail on the head that this completely matches with today's day and age. But then, this is where we have to close. In came the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll cover him in our next discipleship. Let's see how he counters them. But let's see how he tackles them, which is very exciting. But before we, we cover his encounters and tackles with them, let's read a few texts. First of all, let's study more about this Jewish religious system and prove that it's Babylonian. Go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, which your hand was already turned to. Look at this one now. This is Babylonian paganism. Look how it matches with Catholicism or other pagan religions you can think of. Verse 4, Matthew 23, 4. What did Jesus warn about this religious Jewish system? For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works do they for to be seen of men. That matches a lot with the Catholic Church system, does it not? With their rules and their works. Verse 6, And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. Doesn't that match with the Babylonian Catholic Church? Look at verse uh, 9, And call no man your what? Father upon the earth. Doesn't that sound like the Babylonian Catholic Church? Let's keep reading over here. Verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Doesn't that sound like Babylonian Catholicism? Let's look at, this is the proof that this is Babylonian Catholicism. Look at verse 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Look at God's view of history. This is not regular world history. This is God's view of history. This is how you see it. May come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous who? Abel. Abel. Why? Because a guy was following a similar religious spirit that Nimrod and Semiramis would later pick it up. The works that I set up as my sacrifice to my God. Yeah. Not by the blood of the lamb. Like Abel did. Unto the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. God blames the nation of Israel. Why? He sees it all the way back to Jezebel and the Baal prophets. And where, where did Jezebel come from, if you recall in your world history? Zidon, Tyre. What was their religion? Canaanite Baal worship. And remember that Levite priest at the book of Judges in our world history class? He was all the way at the northern part of Dan. And he was doing his own version of Judaism mingled with his, what looks like Babylonian Catholicism. And if you go to that region most border of Dan, that was close to where Tyre, Zidon, and Phoenicia Canaanite religion was located. And remember that Phoenician Canaanite religion was was the most widespread kingdom that time that spread Nimrod and Semiramis' Babylonian religion. Boom to a T. And that's why today you'll see a lot of Jewish elites and where they come from, they come from that Babylonian 
evil spirit that will later affect in later future history we're going to see where we see Rothschilds and other Jewish bankers and elites in Hollywood involved. Look at that. See, he infected the Jews. Satan's Babylonian Nimrod Semiramis evil spirit was affect Babylonian spirit was affecting the Jews. If you read verse 37, do you know what that directly matches with? Revelation 18. God says when Babylon burns, Babylon, see, Babylon burns, Nimrod Semiramis' system, which we know matches with the Roman Catholic Church to a T at Revelation 17 and 18. The verse says when Babylonian bur Babylon Babylonia burns, it says that that city persecuted the Old Testament prophets and the martyrs and all the way to the tribulation. See what God's view of history is? He's seeing, I told you, two main things what Satan used to infect our world. One was a Genesis 6 civilization. The second was a Nimrod Babylonian religious spirit system that goes all the way from the works of Cain. Wow. So then now look at Luke chapter 3, which your other hand is at. Look what God does. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, look at all these big shots mentioned. See that? All these big shots. One of the people that we've neglected. Herod was the ruler over Israel, but Tiberius had to set a Roman governor to take care of the Jews, and that was Pontius Pilate. Look at all these powers in play. The Bible says, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch, of Galilee and his brother Philip Tetrarch of Iturea and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias the Tetrarch of Abilene Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest God says okay check 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 not not important yeah not important the word of God came to John the Baptist Amen. to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. Let's see Jesus Christ combat against this entire system and tore it down. It tore down from the religious section all the way to the top of the Roman power. That's why Satan had to switch plans to the Catholic Church, which we're going to see later on in history. Let's see what this one man, a carpenter's son, was able to do that the world hates today. God, my Father, I pray that today's world history teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. We look forward to see how you're going to tackle this wicked system at our next discipleship class. I trust that the audience look forward to that as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.